Welcome back to the Talking Archive. I'm Josh Jacobs. We're talking with Shelley Herman about her new book, My Peacock Tale, Secrets of an NBC Page. Now, if you'd like to purchase the book or find out more information about it, just go to MyPeacockTale.com. That's MyPeacockTale.com. Now, um, I got a question also for you. You got to work for Chuck Barris on the uh, Gong Show. And I've had several friends who attended a taping of the Gong Show, and they said Chuck Barris was really cool. He talked to the audience during the uh, during the commercial break. And about uh, nine years ago, I interviewed Jim Peck, who worked on uh, Chuck's show Three's a Crowd. Mm-hmm. And uh, he told me the story that one day, because you'd mentioned Chuck Barris treating people to uh, submarine sandwiches and all these foot long sandwiches and all these great foods during the uh, during production. Well, one day Jim said that Chuck Barris called all his staff to the office and they said, "Okay, we'll come and be here at ten o'clock." He said, "Okay." He's like, "All right, get in the limousines here." And there were uh, several limousines that he had. He says, "And we're going to the airport." So they took him to the airport and flew on Chuck Barris's private jet from the airport down to Acapulco. And when they got to Acapulco, they had a fancy dinner waiting for them. Wow. I don't doubt it for a minute um, because he was that guy. Uh, he, you know, people, people were, I know people have a certain impression of Chuck and um, he was one of the kindest, most creative, most supportive people that I ever worked with. He, um, Part of and, and, and you know, as you know, Adam Needif has written a, a, a wonderful new book called Gong This Book that details a lot of the shenanigans that went on at the Gong Show. But people kept thinking that you know Chuck Chuck must be on drugs because this is just too wacky what's going on here. And Chuck was like the straightest guy I ever knew. Uh, I think part of it was because he really had. I mean, at one time he had 28 half hours of television on each week. He was too busy to get wasted. <laughs> he had too much going on. I mean, I can't say that that was the case for everybody who worked for him. They probably, you know, went out in the parking lot and did a little something. <laughs> but he, because of the scrutiny that he was under, I think that Chuck was very paranoid that the federal police or the cops or somebody would shut him down if they caught him with drugs. So mm. I never knew that anywhere of that aspect of Chuck. Very loving. He was a hugger. You know, when it used to be where you could just hug people and you didn't mm-hmm. have to go to human resources, uh, uh, he was like an older brother to me. I, I had met Chuck and the Barris organization as far back as 1972 when I was a contestant on the dating game. So when I came to NBC to work as a page, I knew a lot of these fellows already. So wow. I kind of felt, uh, I felt very comfortable being a little fish out of water myself, you know, because I, I get, didn't have showbiz background. I was just trying to figure it out as I went along. But having, you know, the Barris guys there really, really helped. Now, a lot of people didn't know on the Dane game is the dates would actually be uh-huh. escorted by a chaperone uh, during their first date, at least the date that the show paid for. If you were a woman under 21 years of age at the time, it had to be a female chaperone. Mm. So when I went on both of my dream dates, uh, the first one was to San Diego, and the second was to the Bahamas, Mm. Uh, I I had um, two different women that were my chaperones. The first chaperone was fabulous. She looked like Cher. Uh, The guys were all over her wherever we went in San Diego. Uh, And the second lady was somebody's grandma. And she seemed to be drunk most of the time that she was with me. And we had to share this room, and she snored so horribly. And I, I tried to sleep on the balcony at the hotel, but it was like lightning and thunder. So <laughs> I wound up taking my bedding and putting it into the closet and closing the closet door so I could try to have some quiet. So oh, no. um, <laughs> it, it wasn't part of the dream date. And unfortunately, I didn't wind up continuing dating the men that I had won on television, but I did date one of the guys that worked for the Barris organization who, um, who Adam and Needif and I just were at his house a couple of months ago, uh, getting some pictures. So, um, yeah, a guy, a really nice guy named Vince Longo. Mm. Were there any pictures of you in those, uh, photos, photographs? 
Well, in the book, My Peacock Tale Secrets of an NBC Page, there is a photo that Vince took of me. Uh, I was I was on a tour, and one of the pages came up to me and said, quick, I'm going to take over your tour now. Chuck Barris wants to see you. And I, I'm thinking, there's a problem. So I race over there, and, and Chuck is being really impish backstage. And he goes, just stand right here. And when the curtain opens up, walk out, you'll know what to do. And three, two, one, and all of a sudden it happens. <laughs> and he did a bit where he said, um, uh, I, w- I was lined up with a bunch of other women who worked at NBC. And he said, um, uh, hey, everybody in the audience, these are the girls are from NBC. Girls, introduce yourselves. And the bit was we were supposed to shake hands with each other as though we were introducing ourselves to each other rather than introducing ourselves to the audience. And that was the opening of one of the gong shows. And, um, you know, it was literally my 15 seconds of fame. But I got two really nice pictures out of the deal. Mm. That's great. And uh, one story I wanted to tell you about uh, with Chuck Barris Productions, Gene Patton, a.k.a. Gene Gene the Dancing Machine, uh, he actually shopped at the Hughes Market I worked at back in the mid-1990s. And uh, one of the checkers said, guess who shops here? I said, who? And he mentioned Gene. And I was getting impatient. And finally, one day, I said to one of the checkers, hey, Mary, has Gene Gene the Dancing Machine been here lately? And she said, his wife's in the next checkout lane. His wife's like, (laughs) (laughs) But then finally, uh, a couple weeks later, I I got to meet Gene, just very friendly, down to earth. Um, Yeah. And he had been a stage pretty much a stagehand there pretty much since uh, NBC Studios opened in Burbank in 1962. I asked him, I said, did you ever work on the Magnificent Marble Machine, which was a game show I loved as a little kid, this 25-foot-long pinball machine with enough glass for 10-car windshields? And I said to him, (laughs) Gene, does that pinball machine still exist? Maybe, I don't know, the Smithsonian or some other museum? And he said, that thing wasn't real. Like a lot of people in Hollywood, I'm like, Whoa. No, it wasn't. I got there just as the show ended. And um, and talk talk about, you know, (laughs) a letdown (laughs) when you you would see it. It, it, No, (laughs) no, but also Gene, Gene, like you said, was a genuine stagehand there. Not only did the gong show, but worked The Tonight Show, Hollywood Mm -hmm. Squares. And um, that was part of Chuck's genius is that – you know, he would he would book the acts for the tonight for the uh, for the gong show, and if too many people got gonged off quickly and he had time to fill, what was he going to do? He just grabbed Gene, threw him out there, and said, "You know, go be silly," <laughs> and uh, then that's how all of that happened. I laugh when I think about it that so many oftentimes gong, acts got gonged right away that they had to fill time. Um, didn't they have to f- set a forty five second time limit because one episode? The acts were gone so quickly that they ran out of uh, ran out of talent. Yeah, yeah, it, it got it got to the point that they had to try to do something so that they could figure out how to pad a show out to thirty minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of supermarkets, you got to work on the TV show Supermarket Sweep, which was hosted by David Ruprecht, both on Lifetime and later on Pax TV. Um, tell us about how you got that uh, that job. Uh, my dear friend Fred Wasbrock, who was my agent, and, and Fred, along with uh, David Schwartz and Steve Ryan, wrote several encyclopedias of game shows. So Fred was a very, very knowledgeable man. He uh, had talked to Al Howard, who was the creator of Supermarket Sweep, and said, you know, have I got a girl for you? And um, I remember I, I went to the interview and I purposefully wore a skirt that had fruit all over it, like the pattern of fruit all over mm-hmm. it. So I thought, even if it's just subliminally, he'll think I know food. He'll think <laughs> I know things, you know, and um, and was able to somehow uh, fool him into thinking I could write his show, and he hired me. <laughs> but uh, but it, it, it ta- I'm di- digressing for a moment on this. Um, there was another food show that was on the air about the same time that was um, hosted by Mark Summers that was called Unwrapped. And I would watch Unwrapped not only because I was interested in the show, Mm -hmm. um, but I thought maybe I could steal material to use on Supermarket Sweep. And one of the the things that they had Mark saying was, um, ever wonder how fast ketchup comes out of the the Heinz ketchup bottle? And so I thought, ooh, this is good information. (laughs) So 
I wrote it down, and then, of course, I called the Heinz company, and they said, no, that's not correct, and you have to take into consideration, is it a packet of ketchup? Is it a closed bottle of ketchup? Was it open already? Did they pair it with another ketchup bottle? Was it the industrial size? Was it, you know, so I, I got this whole explanation about, you know, Heinz ketchup. So years later, I'm interviewing for a job with Mark Summers, and I walk into the room, and I said, first of all, i got to tell you, the information they gave you was wrong. I can tell you the correct answer. Da, 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 da. And I just walked in just, you know, you know, both shooting both barrels at the same time. Mm-hmm. And Mark just looked at me and went, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, uh, I actually met Mark the first time uh, at Peter Marshall signing for his book backstage with the original Hollywood Square. Um, and then the early was days it, was that at, was that at Bookstar on, on Ventura Boulevard? It was, yeah. Were you there that I day? I was there. Oh I man, was I didn't get much there. I didn't get to meet you that day. Maybe I did. I don't remember, but uh, yeah, it was a fun day. I remember. Uh, gosh, a lot of people were there. Tom Poston and his wife Suzanne Plachette. Okay, okay, I got a story about that. Okay. Fred Wasbrock was a massive collector of game show photos, and he had a picture of Tom Poston. It's kind of a famous game show picture where um, it's a split screen where it looks like one side of his face is smiling and the other side of his face is grimacing. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty wacky picture. It's in in some of Fred's books. So um, I said, hey, have you showed the picture to Tom Poston? And Fred was very shy about it. He goes, "Ah, I don't want to disturb him. So I took the picture over to Suzanne Plachette because I figured I'd chat her up. Mm-hmm. And she took the picture over to uh, to Tom. And they knew each other back in the 50s. They had dated. They both married other people. And then they got back together again later in life, and they actually did get married. So she took the picture over to Tom, a, a very wacky-looking picture. And she said, this is the man I fell in love with. This is the man that I wanted to have make whoopee with. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had a very nice exchange there, and, and, and she just loved seeing that picture of Tom. <laughs> That's great. And, in fact, uh, Tom Poston, a lot of people remember him as Bob Newhart's handyman, George Utley, on uh, Newhart. But also he was Bob Newhart's buddy, college buddy, Cliff the Peeper Murdoch on the Bob Newhart show. And it's hilarious that Bob's wife, Emily, played by Suzanne Plachette, could not stand Cliff. She could not stand him. And the funny thing is they got married in real life. Just who would have thunk? <laughs> I think it's so sweet. I just, you know, it's sometimes people are just meant to be together. Oh, yeah. And um, I took a picture with Tom. Suzanne was busy uh, elsewhere. So as uh, Tom and I took the picture, he's, he said to me after we took the photos, like, his finger was on the lens. Oh, no. Just kidding. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I got that picture. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, I've, I actually believed him at first. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and then, uh, Susan Stafford was there, your good friend. And she, um, yeah. I said to her kid, can I take a picture with you? She said, sure. And so we took the first, uh, picture and she says, okay, one more. And then she gives me a kiss on the cheek and you should see my face. I'm like, ah! <laughs> That sounds exactly like her. <laughs> but she was a sweetheart. I mean, just uh, tell us about how, I mean, she's been a blessing to a lot of people. How has she uh, been a blessing to you? You know how there's sometimes people you don't talk to for months at a time, and then they just call at the right moment? Mm-hmm. She's one of those people. And I'll have some kind of, crisis going on, or I'll just be feeling kind of blue about something, and all of a sudden, just she'll just call, and it, she's like, I'm just driving, down the, just driving down the road thinking of you. So she's somebody that has been in and out of my life for a very long time, and of, of course, you know, she, you know, was dearly in love with, with Dan Enright, um, mm-hmm. so I, there's, there's that aspect of her life. There's the life when she was the original letter turner on Wheel of Fortune, and and now she devotes her her life to the ministry, and she's very active in causes all over the United States. But she's based out of Las Vegas now. Oh, okay, wow. And have you gotten to visit her recently? Uh... When she comes to town, I I don't like going to Las Vegas, uh. so I haven't I haven't been to see her her place, but. 
I'll, I'll, I'll probably wind up going there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Viva Lost Wages. Uh, that's what my uh, head of promotions at the radio station I worked at years ago used to always do. Um, he dressed up as Elvis for one Halloween, and after that he kept on breaking off into El- Elvis impressions uh, every couple of days. Um, <laughs> now, you uh, um, had a great story. I, n- not a great story, but... Uh, you clarified I'll a lot. I'll be the judge of that. Well, <laughs> I don't know if it's a great story, but uh, yeah, you'll be the judge of that. Um, the whole Joan Rivers thing on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson, I you know read the stories, and I didn't realize wh- everything that occurred until what she wrote about, which was a sad thing because you know Joan and Johnny seemed to be really close, and then when she went to Fox's, you know they had the, the falling out and never talked again. Um, that's just, I mean, yeah, I just, I was, I was kind of sad about that, that Joan and Johnny never did make up. Well, um, you're right about the fact that they were very close friends. Johnny mentored Joan and, and they were very close friends. She was also very close with uh, Peter and Alice LaSalle and, and Peter LaSalle, um, well, well, it seemed like Fred DeCordova was the figurehead at the Tonight Show. Peter was the one who was really the brains of the operation. Mm. And um, I, I go into detail about how this practical joke, misunderstanding, rampant narcissism all contributed to this bad communication and how if only Joan would have picked up the phone to Johnny when this fake memo was circulating saying, Johnny, what's the deal? Why isn't my name on this list of potential hosts for The Tonight Show when you retire? The whole thing would have been over with. Mm. But but this, this list, again, fake list of names. Johnny was nowhere near retiring. Um, Letterman's name wasn't on the list. Leno's name wasn't on the list. I mean, you know, those were like, you know, the heavy hitters back in the day. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Joan didn't try to get some clarification and she just kind of said, you know, F Johnny, I'm going out on my own. um, It was very hurtful to a lot of people. And eventually this poor decision making um, cost her many decades of her career that she had to rebound from. In fact, uh, Jay Leno never did have Joan on The Tonight Show, but when Jimmy Fallon took over in 2014, Joan was a guest for the first time on that program for about in about 28 years. Jay always said that he did it out of reverence to Johnny, and I can understand that. Um, this is a this is somebody who was a good friend who hurt him very badly. Yeah, um, you know, and Joan did. Le- and Joan did Letterman's show. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, she did. She she did his show too. But um, part of the problem that they were having with Joan, even before this memo came out, is Johnny Carson had a certain audience, and then Joan was starting to get very edgy, mm. and she was asked to kind of tone down her material. But she was pulling in bigger numbers sometimes than when Johnny was hosting because she really was very abrasive. And, you know, in, in a time when when she could say things that were now would be very politically incorrect. I don't mm-hmm. even know that Joan would have the same career now if she were here now, uh, because you just can't get away with saying that kind of stuff. You know, Elizabeth Taylor's fat, somebody's ugly, things like that. You can't say that kind of stuff. Mm-mm. So, um it's it's a it's it's a tragedy what happened. It shouldn't have happened, and um, I, I feel very bad for for the people that were involved with the whole debacle. It's just it's heartbreaking. This is the Talking Archive. We're speaking with Shelley Herman. She's the author of My Peacock Tale: Secrets of an NBC Page. And next time we share more upbeat stories, including when she got to meet Super Agent Jay Bernstein. Now, a chance encounter translated to something great many years later. Also, we're going to be speaking about Mame Son as well as Chasen's Chili. That's next time on the Talking Archive.